Everyone, what we're going to look at today is this idea of resistance and what resistance depends on. So we've seen some resistors in the labs in the class, and we want to see how can we make resistors have more resistance to current or less resistance to current. And there's four things that we can say that resistance depends on. How big the wire is, or the size of the wire, the length of the wire, so how long that wire is, uh, the temperature of the wire does affect the resistance, and conductivity, meaning what the wire is actually made of or what the resistor is actually made of. Those little color bands actually tell you the amount of ohms each of those resistors are, but if those were stripped of the colors there, it would still be the same resist. Resistivity is what we call a constant. It's a ratio of how resistive a material is. And really it's just a ratio of the electric field that's pushing charges through the wire over the current density, the amount of charge per unit area. So if we want to come up with a, an equation to solve for resistance based on this resistivity, let's look at that ratio that they told us. So we know electric field is volts per meter, and we know that current density is the amount of current per unit area. And this rho that we've given for resistivity is the ratio of electric field per current density. So all I have to do is then take the voltage over the length and divide that by the current over the amps. And I get that double fraction there, which is really disgusting, so let's try to get rid of that and take the inverse. And when we get the inverse, we get that. We get the volts per length times the area over the current. And if you look, we do have something that is familiar to us now. We do have current down here in the bottom and volts up here on the top. Voltage over current, remember, was our resistance of the wire. So resistance times area over length. Those are all the things that would equal resistivity. If I want to solve for the actual resistance of a wire, it would be rho times length all over area. So this is how we find the ohms for any of our resistors, our wires, our filaments. We take this resistivity constant, we take the length of the wire, and we divide it by the area. And let's just check the units on that, remembering that length is meters, area is meters squared, and I need an ohm in the end. That means that resistivity must be an ohm meter. That way I can get the amount of resistance that I need from this formula. So let's look at the analogy for why a wire depends on these three things. So you can see that resistance again is rho times length over area. And we can change a couple things here. Right now the current resistance of this wire is 0.67 ohms. And that arrow at the bottom is indicating that current is flowing from left to right. So the way we tried to imagine this in class, imagine that we're trying to push an electron through the wire. So it's like a little freshman running through the hallways. And each of those little dots there are the seniors in the hallways. So what happens when those charges try to move through? Well, we could change the length of the hallway. So if I change the length of the hallway here and try to rerun our scenario, that electron has a longer path to travel. So as it tries to go through here, it's going to keep bumping off of all these different molecules, and it's going to be harder to get through a long hallway compared to a short hallway. So due to all, this, all these collisions and fights, it's harder for that electron to drift from one end of the wire to the other. All right, what else can I do to increase my resistance. To increase my resistance, I could change my area. Let's make the hallway smaller. So now as the hallway shrinks, we've got the same amount of people in the hallway. We've got a really long hallway, but it's very, very skinny. So with a skinny hallway, again, that electron is trying to fight its way down the line and it's very, very restricted. It's very hard to move from one end of the wire to the next. And the last thing I could do to change the, or the resistance of this wire is change the resistivity. If you see me moving the resistivity up here, all you're seeing the simulator do is sh show there are more atoms packed into that volume. So if there's more atoms packed in there, then it's harder to get through that hallway. The hallway is completely packed. It's during class change, and those freshmen just can't make it through. So how would we make the resistance easier. Well, we can change the material, something that has less atoms, or we could change the length of the hallway, make it a short, tiny hallway. That would be very easy to get through. Or we could also increase the area. 
Now that we have an increased area, those electrons should be able to zip right through, maybe a few collisions on the way through the wire, and that's about it. So short hallways, large wires can allow lots of current to flow through. We have very low resistance. To increase the resistance, we're going to shrink the hallways, make them longer, and change the material. And we said, well, how does, what does this do for the resistor? We said that when we have a particular resistance, when those charges try to make their way down the wire and they drift and bump into the different molecules, if a little freshman bumped you and knocked you over, you would get a little mad and a little heated. So technically, the wire starts to give off heat and energy as those charges try to drift down the wire. So that's why length, area, and resistivity all affect resistance. One thing that we didn't throw in here was the temperature of the wire. What would temperature have to do? Well, on a very cold day, everyone that was moving in this hallway would be moving very slowly. So a charge would be able to find the gaps very easily and make it through. So if you decrease the temperature of a conductor, you can decrease its resistance. But if it's a hot day, say near the end of the year, all the people in the hallways are running around like crazy. So when that electron tries to make it through, it's just going to collide more often with all the atoms. So increased temperature also has an increased resistance. But that's not in this formula. At least we don't see it in this formula. It's there. It's right here in this chart with the temperature coefficient. So you can see the different materials here like copper, iron, lead. They all have a different resistivity and they all have a different temperature coefficient. So where does the temperature coefficient come in? It comes into the resistivity. Is your original resistivity plus the resistivity times alpha, which is your temperature coefficient, times your change in temperature. So as your temperature goes up, you're going to increase your resistivity, which is gonna increase the resistance of the material. So hot wires are more restricted to current flow than cold wires. And here's just a list of the different wire gauges that if you go to the store and try to buy some wire you would see that low gauge have really really large areas and very large diameters and the higher the gauge number the smaller the wire. Large hallways, those four gauge wires have high currents that can run through them while the 22 gauge wire has low currents that can flow through them just based on the size of the wire. And like I said before Color has nothing to do with it except if you want to know the resistance and you make a ceramic resistor like this and you want to know its actual resistance, there's a color scheme. You use those color bands to give you the exact number for each resistor. One quick little answer on the resistance of this one. All you do is you connect the first band to the first number, so I get three. The second band is the second number, so in this case zero, and then you're going to times ten to whatever the last band is, which is the sixth. So I have 30 times 10 to the sixth, or 30 million ohms is the resistance of this resistor. The tolerance is just your plus or minus. So this is a 10% tolerance. So I could be off plus or minus three mega ohms for that individual resistor. So the last topic we wanna to talk about here is this idea of what we call internal resistance. When you go and try to measure the voltage of a battery, We've taken voltmeters many times before, and with our voltmeters, we've touched the positive terminal and we've touched the negative terminal and see what the reading is. That'll be the real uh, terminal voltage of the battery, meaning the potential from the low end to the high end. But if you start connecting that battery to a resistor, what you may find is that as soon as current starts to flow around the circuit, the terminal voltage will drop. So it's like there's some type of resistance inside the battery itself. So as those chemical reactions are happening and you get less and less material to create chemical reactions, what we have is an internal resistance that grows and starts to decrease the amount of current that you get through the wire. If you measure just a battery, uh, dead or charged, it will tell you its terminal voltage. What you want to know is when that battery is trying to be used, as the current flows through the battery, does the terminal voltage drop? So if I would go around this loop from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, you can see that I would cross the battery there and receive the entire EMF of the battery. That would be the voltage here. Then I would subtract by the 
internal resistance, that I times little r. That would be the voltage through the little resistor. And that should equal the potential difference from point A to point B. So the voltage you measure out there across the resistor. To measure voltage in a resistor, I need to know its current, and I need to know its resistance. So it's just I times R. If I want to solve for the current going through here, do some algebra, and you should end up with this. The EMF over the big resistance, whatever you're trying to power, plus the internal resistance. When a battery is fresh and new, this internal resistance is pretty much zero. There's really no resistance from the battery to raise charges from high to low. The current going through the circuit would be whatever the battery's voltage is, say 12 volts, and let's say this is a 10 ohm resistor. So my amps would be 1.2 amps. However, the longer you run a battery, and the more those chemical reactions happen, the more that internal resistance grows. So as the internal resistance grows, the current is gonna drop through your circuit. So we're gonna see less and less charges leave the battery because they have to fight and lose energy as they try to move through the battery before they even go out to your terminals. Uh, batteries are rated in something called amp hours. So if you look on the side of a battery, it'll tell you the amount of amp hours. And when we multiply those two things together, remember amps is coulombs per second, and hours we can just convert to seconds, one amp hour is actually equal to 3600 coulombs of charge. So that's the amount of charge delivered to the circuit in one amp hour. And the last thing with uh, batteries here is the amount of power that's delivered by a battery. Well, we've already come up with our power equations. It's current times voltage. In this case, it would be the current times the electromotive force. So take I times the electromotive force and you can get your power coming from the battery. That would be the amount of energy per second it gives the charges. Out here in the resistor you can do the same equation but that would be the power lost in the resistor to heat, sound, or whatever else you're trying to do. So we looked at what resistance depends on. It depends on how you create your resistors, how long they are, how wide they are, and what materials you use. And we also looked at this idea of internal resistance inside a battery, trying to decrease your terminal voltage so that it would restrict the flow of charge. So that's how we know if a battery is charged or, as we say, dead.